everyone, I'm Dr. Mesh Seibel. I'm so excited to be here in Orlando, Florida at the annual meeting of the North American Menopause Society. We've got experts gathered here from all over the world to bring you the latest information on menopause. I'm so excited to share this information with you. Let me just ask you please to just mention your name and yes, where I'm, you're from. I'm uh, Mitch Harmon. I'm currently in Phoenix, Arizona where I have been the uh, director and president of the Kronos Longevity Research Institute which is uh, a not-for-profit uh, dedicated to the study of aging and hormones. And you recently had an enormous study, at least in its impact, that has just come out and presented at the North American Menopause Society. I wonder if you could just tell us briefly about it. Well, we hope it's been useful because it sure was a lot of work. Uh, it's called the Kronos Early Estrogen Prevention Study. It was a study designed by a group of colleagues uh, with uh, a lot of expertise in women's health uh, covering the waterfront from uh, GYN endocrinology to um, lipidology to uh, general endocrinology, uh, but all of us with uh, considerable experience in, the, in issues surrounding um, replacement therapy in, in the menopause. And our concern was that the WHI study uh, seemed to show that there was actually a worsening of the risk of cardiovascular disease in the women that they studied, but the, that the women that they studied, when we, when we looked critically at their study, um, didn't represent the usual age uh, and, uh, uh, and, and some other uh, anthrop anthropometric and, uh, and other kinds of uh, characteristics that we see in, in the typical woman who is considering uh, hormonal treatment for recent onset menopause and symptoms. So what happened was 10 years ago was the Women's Health Initiative, the WHI, which showed there were a lot of dangers from taking estrogen with blood clots and breast cancer and uh, strokes and heart attacks. And this was a follow-up study. And how did it differ from that study? Well, for one thing, we chose to study women who were recently menopausal. That is, we wanted them to definitely be menopausal, so they were within six months of their last menstrual period, but they had to have hormone uh, a profile that was consistent with menopause. And most importantly, they had to be less than three years from their last menstrual period, which put them into the age group of uh, something between 48 and 58. Uh, their average, in fact, was 52.7. How is that different from the last one, the WHI? And the WHI, their women on average were 63 years old, which is 12 years after the average age of menopause. And our thought was this is plenty of time in which to develop uh, coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis in general, and it had already been shown pretty convincingly by the HERS study that um, estrogen replacement treatment is not uh, a particularly effective way of going at secondary prevention once you have the disease. The WHI was billed as a primary prevention trial because the women had not had clinical disease, but the, the perception on our part was that that a lot of them almost certainly had preclinical disease, that they already had lesions in their arteries, they had plenty of plaque, and that if you give especially oral estrogen superimposed on the existence of plaque, and particularly at-risk plaque, you're going to see early on um, an increase in events, and, and that's exactly what they observed in the first 18 months of their study. They had an excess of events, and particularly in the oldest women. So what happened was, and you, the WHI, which is now 10 years ago, actually had women that were 65 to 79 years old, and in the time between menopause and the time they got in that study, they could have already had heart disease that made them have a stroke or contributed to a stroke. And your study, or, 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 or a heart attack. And your study looked at women who are an average age of 42, uh, 52 to see if getting rid of that lead time, there would be less risk for, for stroke and heart attack. Yeah. And what did you find? And well, and this is what, that, that what became known as the timing hypothesis, that there was a window of opportunity mm -hmm. during which estrogen might actually help prevent heart disease. Well, we didn't have the resources that WHI did, so it, we really need to, to say up front that we chose what are called surrogate endpoints. What we did was image the arteries and look at the rate of progression of a couple of things that are relevant to clinical events 
going forward, but are, that are not themselves clinical events. And, mm -hmm. and that's an important distinction. So instead of waiting for a stroke to happen or a heart attack or a blood clot, you were looking at test results that suggested one could happen or suggested one wasn't likely to happen. Exactly. And what were those tests? So the, the two things we measured were the rate uh, at which the wall of the carotid artery, this big artery here in the neck, the common carotid artery, get, gets thicker because there were a lot of data in the literature to say that that rate of thickening or how thick those arteries are actually is quite predictive of strokes and heart attacks, strangely enough. Even though the carotid supplies the brain, uh, presum the presumption is that whatever's happening in the carotid artery, something similar is probably happening in the arteries that supply the heart. The so it's an arteries. ultrasound of the neck vein, right? which and implies what's happening uh, in the risk of stroke and also heart attack. Exactly. And then as a secondary endpoint, because this is something that changes rather more slowly, um, we looked at the de deposition of calcium, the presence of calcium in the coronary arteries themselves. And this can be done by high resolution CAT scan. It's an x-ray technique. Uh, these techniques have gotten better and better over time. Um, if we had to do it again today, we could have done even a better job of it than we did. But um, that said, coronary artery calcium is another very good predictor of future events, events in the next five years. So we're actually looking at the anatomy of the arterial wall rather than just risk factors. So just like women can see on a mammogram that they have calcium spots in their breast, this test that you did actually was looking for calcium spots uh, in the arteries that go uh, carry the blood to in the heart itself. Exactly. And, and what we found um, was that number one, the rate of change of that thickening of the carotid artery was very, very slow in all of these women. They were all quite healthy. Um, we purposely screened out people who looked like they might have pre-existing heart disease mm -hmm. by, by a number of criteria because our whole hypothesis was that our treatment would only work in people who didn't have heart disease yet. Mm -hmm. So we wound up with a very healthy group of relatively young women. And then when we looked at the rate of progression of, of uh, the thickening of the carotid artery by ultrasound, it was very, very slow in all three treatment groups, and I'll tell you in a second what the treatment groups were, um, and no different from one treatment group to another. So, so if you didn't already have thickening uh, in your artery in your neck, the uh, giving estrogen didn't seem to make it any worse it than not giving. It didn't seem to make it any worse, uh, but it didn't make it any better either. Right. Um, and, and as I say, those rates were very slow compared to what had been reported in other studies of women who were older and at higher risk. Mm -hmm. um, the, the estrogen regimens that we compared, by the way, were the sort of old standard that everybody uses, uh, conjugated equine estrogen, which is mainly sold in this country as Premarin. Mm -hmm. uh, we used a somewhat lower dose because there has been a trend to use lower doses, number one. Uh, and number two, we were concerned with safety and we were looking at the WHI women who took a higher dose of 0.625 of Premarin and we thought, well, you know, let's keep our women as safe as possible. There are enough indications that this lower dose still has beneficial effects on important risk mm -hmm. factors for heart disease, but maybe we'll have a little less risk of breast cancer, uh, thromboembolic disease, you know, strokes and, and, and pulmonary embolus and, and venous uh, uh, it's called deep vein uh, venous thrombosis. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to keep these women at a, as low risk as possible. And then our other estrogen regimen was something that's coming more and more into favor for, for a number of reasons, and that's the transdermal estradiol patch. And that's gotten very popular with the, with the people who are pushing what so-called bioidentical hormones because estradiol is the same estrogen that your own ovary makes if you're a woman. Mm -hmm. um, but the other advantage of the transdermal is not so much which estrogen is in the patch, but the route of administration. It goes in through the skin, and then it immediately gets into this big pool of blood that circulates around the body. So it gets diluted out to the same kinds of levels that you see if your ovary is working. If, um, if you take oral estrogen, it first goes straight to the liver because it's being absorbed from the intestine mm -hmm. and it reaches the liver in very high concentrations compared to anything the body ever sees except maybe during pregnancy. So and you gave two kinds of estrogens, a patch mm 
at a typical dose and an oral uh, medication which was in this instance Premarin but this is one that then had to go through the liver so you ch you looked at two different ways of giving it right and measured these outcomes exactly and there were some interesting differences in some of the ancillary or subsidiary outcomes because we measured a lot of things besides just the coronary artery calcium and the carotid intermedial thickness mm -hmm. but but the important thing uh, is that with regard to our arterial imaging outcomes there really wasn't any difference between those two treatments as I said earlier the CIMT the, car the carotid uh, intima media thickness was no different between the two groups and for the um, coronary calcium we saw a trend for both treatment groups, both of the active estrogen groups, to have a little less coronary calcium deposited over time, especially in that group of women who already had a bit of coronary calcium at the get-go, mm -hmm. at baseline. So if a woman were to start this medication and her arteries in her neck were in a normal place, and the calcium in her heart was minimal or not there, taking estrogen either by mouth or through the skin had no negative impact at all. Right, at least not over four years. Mm -hmm. And as I say, we saw a suggestion of a benefit for the calcium effect in the coronary arteries, but our numbers were so small that this was not a significant effect. So we, we can't draw conclusions from it. We can only say, gee, this was intriguing. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, the other things uh, that, that, that really came out of the study were, number one, some benefits for cognition and mood. Mm -hmm. uh, some benefits for, for cognition, especially uh, verbal memory, in, in the lowest risk group of our women. These were, these were uh, ancillary studies done by our colleague Sanjay Asthana at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, these were funded by the National Institute on Aging. Uh, we saw some improvements in symptoms of depression, although these were not depressed women. Again, uh, with, with the estrogen group. Um, and we saw improvements in sexual function, and of course, um, the expected improvements in the symptoms of menopause and, and hot flashes and, and night sweats and sleeplessness and so on. So a lot of the good things that we had every reason to believe estrogen would do, it did in fact do, uh, and we also had a couple of, of surprises. We saw some improvements in orgasm and libido um, in the women who were taking the transdermal estrogen but not the conjugated estrogen. So, so I think these are all interesting things that need follow-up, uh, that need further research to determine you know, what these uh, um, potential benefits might really mean for, uh, for the average woman. That's great. So in, in, in summary, what you're saying then is that it appeared to be very safe in terms of the uh, veins in your neck, risking of stroke, in terms of the artery calcification in the heart, it seemed to not worsen it. It may have a tendency to make it better. That women noticed that they had a better, se the, uh, at least there was the beginning information that there was an improvement in sex and an improvement in depression. Even though they weren't depressed, they felt better. And um, mood overall seemed good. So these are very positive things from your study. Yes, exactly. I mean, we're, we're happy with these outcomes. Uh, but we think that, that more research is certainly needed. And one of the things we'd like to do is follow these women out further, get uh, additional studies on their arteries four or five years down the line, and see if this, if this four years of treatment now is reflected in any outcomes further down the line as these women get older and the likelihood of disease increases just because of age. I really thank you for taking time. It's a fabulous study and a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you much, and I hope that uh, this will be helpful to the people that follow your blog. I think it will.